Hi everybody, my name is Amy Hanready and on behalf of Caltash, I'm happy to welcome you to this recorded webinar. Our title is Show and Tell, Educators Share Distance Learning Strategies for Students with Significant Support Needs. So our goals in this webinar are really just to highlight a few practical ideas that we feel can help to support continued learning and engagement in school for students with significant support needs. We reached out to educators to highlight some silver linings and successes and ask them to share some examples from their own experiences. And we're also highlighting a few areas that we've recognized as some priorities from families, which are communication, engagement with peers and school staff, and continued academic growth. In order to make sure that you as educators and families have access to all of the materials that we'll be discussing today, we created a Padlet and the link is here on the screen. It's padlet.com slash Karen, K-A-R-E-N-F, Cull, C-U-L-L, slash Tash, underscore distance learning. And there's also a scan code where you can hold your smartphone camera up to the screen and you can get to the link that way as well. So I wanted to start us off with some quick context. Let's look at where we are now and where we think we might be headed. So first of all we know that almost every school and district across the United States and we know um, also around the world have currently stopped in-person instruction. We also know that any return to in-person schooling is going to vary significantly by region. So whatever the format, we know that distance learning will likely remain as a strategy for schools and districts to serve students who cannot attend school for a variety of reasons. We also know that our students with more significant support needs are students who may have health concerns or underlying conditions that might make it less likely that they will return to school quickly. When schools and districts first made the rapid shift to distance learning, I know that as an educator, some of the first questions that uh, arose in my circles were all about how students with significant support needs would be able to access education through a primarily online format. And the experiences over the last two months have really confirmed that students with significant support needs and their families face some very unique and additional challenges when their kids are not able to attend school in person. We also know from learning from a variety of educators and families that we're starting to see some promising practices emerging and there are also several areas of success. In order to learn a little bit more about the experiences of families as they were embarking on this new world of distance learning for their children with more significant needs, a work group that I'm a part of conducted a survey we were able to get 145 responses and we know that the respondents were from across the United States. Most of the respondents had children that attended a traditional district school, although about 14% attended a charter school and a very small amount, about less than 5%, attended a private school. So I'm just going to share a few of the responses to give an idea of the current landscape for families. So when asked what their current hopes were for a distance learning program, families indicated that their greatest hopes focused on emphasizing communication and literacy skills to continue to develop ac academic skills and for students to remain connected with their peers and their teachers. Not surprisingly, uh, greatest challenges during this time really centered around the struggles to provide support to a child with more significant needs while managing a variety of other responsibilities. 
Families also indicated that they had a hard time encouraging their child to participate in the activities provided by school and that they were also working to support multiple children or individuals in their household who needed care. We provided a list of potential distance learning activities and asked families which they felt would be the most important to them in designing a distance learning program for their child. So some of the most popular items that families were interested in included at the top of the list uh, live times with educators with their child via phone or video conference, that their children would be included in general education distance learning opportunities, that they would receive from educators interactive activities that they could do with their child at home, and that their child could participate in some live meetings with their class. And then I just wanted to also point out that in terms of priorities from families, online activities is about at the middle of the list and packets or worksheets is also about three fourths of the way down the list. I think it's also helpful to recognize the range of activities that families found to be important in their child's program. So, that means that we're really going to need to consider the interests and needs of each family in designing their program. Now we provided the same list and asked families which have been a part of the distance learning program for their child thus far. So up at the top, the most common element of a distance learning program was those online activities for children to do. Next was live class meetings with their child's class. And then third was packets and worksheets that were sent home for their child to complete. So you can see already that there's a little bit of a mismatch between what families are hoping the distance learning program will look like and what educators have been able to provide thus far. And then finally, we asked, to what degree does your child appear to enjoy their distance learning program. And if we look at the first two, we can see that about 65% of the families felt that their child either did not at all enjoy or only slightly enjoyed their distance learning program. And less than 4% indicated that their child enjoyed the program very much. Based on the experiences of families thus far, we've created some guidelines, training materials, and resources that are also available on the Padlet. These are just an example of a few of the resources we created. Uh, this is a family support plan and a family check-in that are meant to be used as a template for educators to uh, scaffold some conversations with families and work towards a really individualized program. So what do we know about what works so far? We know that most educators who are finding success are really working out a tailored program for individual students that involves a combination of more high-tech and more low-tech types of experiences. So our high-tech experiences include those synchronous online uh, video discussion or Zoom groups, asynchronous activities where families can work on their own time through uh, online applications, recordings that are sent, uh, that are created by an educator or by others, and it allows a little bit more flexibility and can be a little bit more tailored or individualized. And then finally, some families are having great success with low or no tech options, and these might include some interactive activities that are designed around the students' needs and goals that includes uh, packets or worksheets, and then it would also include the wide range of communication strategies that we're using to connect with families like phone calls, emails, text messaging, and video messaging. 
as the professional community continues to learn more about promising practices in distance learning, we've also seen a few uh, resources and publications. Uh, this is one that has come out recently from the Office of Special Education Programs, OSEP, and this document has a really helpful summary of the range of evidence-based and promising practices that are used with students with disabilities thus far. This is also available on the Padlet for you to read through. Okay, so let's move into some show and tell. So our first presenter is Sarah Brady, who will talk about how she embedded instruction of communication skills within a peer group lunch bunch activity for her students. Hi, my name is Sarah Brady. I am a sixth grade special education teacher at Wish Charter, which is a fully inclusive charter school located in Westchester. And I created this lunch group for my student, Finn, through collaboration with his mom. We really wanted to come up with ways that he could meaningfully connect with his peers. Uh, virtual learning was great. He loved seeing their faces, but it didn't allow for as much back and forth exchange, especially when formal instruction started. So I came up with the idea of having a Zoom lunch call twice a week. These specific students were in Finn's advisory class, which is essentially homeroom, and I would see them every morning interact with him. So I brought it up to them. I said, hey, are you interested in this? And they were like, oh my god, yes. And then they invited another friend to join. So strategies that I've used during this lunch call, I do a lot of modeling. I downloaded Finn's pod system, the exact system that he uses on his uh, personal device onto my personal iPad. And so when he, uh, I'm communicating and when he's communicating or his peers, I'm modeling that language for him. His mom, uh, she's amazing in regards to AAC. Uh, and she kind of taught me, oh, you know, to tell him what page you're going into, you know, even if he's not yet accessing that vocabulary, you're kind of helping him to understand where you got to those those different words. And I also uh, want to pause and make sure everyone's hearing Finn when he does participate and communicate, and also to regularly say, hey, is there anything, Finn, you wanna add? Uh, we're working on him making um, comments uh, and you know asking questions and just uh, increasing his consistent communication with his device, his talker. And it feels very natural. Um, usually I start with, how's everyone feeling? Just a social emotional check-in, especially given the circumstances of virtual learning. And then I kind of just let it go where, I, I let it go, the conversation go where it's gonna go naturally. All right, you guys know what I'm gonna ask. Let me go into questions. How is people everyone how is everyone let's go around i want to hear uh misha i see you first on my screen how are you feeling girl let's hear i'm feeling really really happy and excited that it's friday and and it got excited mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i forgot it is friday finn misha said she feels happy and happy excited Shaking the hands. Same. Finn's ready to share. Oh, Finn, tell us. Say it again. Friendly. You're feeling friendly. I wonder, Finn, if you feel friendly because you're in your group chat with your all your friends. Angie, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good, I guess. Mm -hmm. like, that's, listen. Good is good. Good, good yeah. is good. good. So opinion, you're feeling good. Good. Awesome. If he doesn't say anything and, you know, I hear something, I'm like, oh, wait, it sounds like Finn was saying something. Finn, can you say it again? I, I see Finn typing. Banana? Finn, say it again. 
something bagel. Bagel? Yum. I love bagels. I love gravy. Mm. Bagels. bagels are the best. What is that? So if there's a uh, pause or lull in the conversation, I may guide it like, hey, what are we doing this weekend? So it's, we have sleep, sleep, movie, concert, sleep, movie, and concert. Did I miss anything? Finn, do you, what are you going to do this weekend? Or did you have something to add? Work out, work out. That's an interesting idea. Man. What did he say? Say it again. Say it again. Oh, is he gone? Um... The Polar Carol. He said the Polar Express and then Carol. I think Polar he's Express. Head to Christmas. Oh, ben, are you in a Christmas movie mood? Because let me tell you, you can totally watch Christmas movies. In Natural and Poots Christmas Vacation. But it's been such an amazing and honestly easy way to give him that access to his peers. And it's been so meaningful for them. Next. We're going to look at some ideas for explicit communication and literacy instruction. Asia McKee, a Caltech board member, will be sharing about the resources that she's gathered from a speech language pathologist, Julie Maves. Hi, my name is Asia McKee and I am a Caltech board member. I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Special Education at Cal State Fullerton. Today, I'm going to talk with you a bit about communication and literacy. The presentations you are about to see and the strategies that will be used have been developed by Julie Mavis. Julie is a speech and language pathologist for a local school district here in Orange County, California. She will demonstrate read alouds using a Big Mac switch, visual supports and other tools using expanding expression tool, EET, as well as core boards. This presentation aligns with TASH's principles. Augmentative and alternative communication, also known as AAC, promotes equity and inclusive practices by providing access to general education literacy curriculum. Okay, we're going to start with read alouds with a Big Mac switch. So today I'm going to demonstrate how to use our single message voice output device um, when reading a, a book. And so Polar Bear, Polar Bear, or Brown Bear, Brown Bear, um, these are wonderful stories that have repeating lines that you can repeat the same line and the child can participate in. Um, I'll show you some other ones for, where you just pick out a word, um, but this one's going to be, what do you hear? So first of all, again, I turn it on. I press the button until it's red. And then I uh, record my message, I push down. What do you hear? Let it up, push it to set it, and it should be ready to go. What do you hear? And then we can read the book. Here we go. Polar bear, polar bear. What do you hear? I hear a lion roaring in my ear. Lion, lion. What do you hear? I hear a hippopotamus. <laughs> snorting in my ear. Next, we're going to go to her demonstration of using visual supports and EET, which I'll briefly mention at the end of this portion. For sake of time, I'm going to skip to different parts of the Google slide presentation so that you could see her use of visual supports. Hi, boys and girls. Oh, I'm so excited. We're going to start our unit on our life cycles from egg to chicken. From egg to chicken. Miss Julie is going to pick the eggs up tomorrow and we're going to start. So attached to this video, you'll have an egg calendar and some other wonderful things. And every day or maybe three times a week, I will be videotaping and we will be pushing this out so that you can come back and look at the video. The eggs are in the incubator. Say it with me, boys and girls. Eggs in incubator. Very good. The incubator keeps the eggs warm. Your turn. The incubator keeps the eggs warm. Good job. 
So when you are able to access this through the shareable link through Google Drive that Julie uh, made available for us, you'll see that there are, uh, it's really, she's done a whole sequence of days for this for this story about baby chicks. And she uses visual supports throughout. Here she has a story, where do chicks come from? And then she has slides that actually show close-ups. You'll see pictures and videos of the actual chicks that have hatched. And then she has these, and it's there's a link at the bottom, items that we need for the hatched baby chicks. And again, it's supporting use of literacy or supporting literacy skills through a visual support. So here you'll see a video and she actually uses a core board. She also shares resources with us. So you'll see these different links, some parent information, different YouTube songs that you could utilize, painting art. Here is the the information for the expanding expression tool, the following visuals were created to provide support and organization to student language responses using this particular tool. So she gives us link to the tools there as well as some vocabulary and parent information. A wonderful resource for you to learn how to utilize visual supports when reading stories or to use it with your child or your students. So for the last uh, strategy here, we are going to go to core boards. So Julie has shared with us read aloud stories and other activities utilizing core boards. This is several slides long, but I'm just going to show a portion of this video clip. Look, I see three little yellow baby chicks. Oh, it is soft. Yeah, it is fluffy. Ah. Hear it? I hear it cheap. I'm going to go down a few slides. So she shows here the baby chick core board that she has developed particularly for this specific activity. And then also she has one here for polar bear, polar bear. I'm gonna put the links on this slide, but again, I believe in the end, at the end of the entire webinar, you will also have access to these links. But here it is for the Big Mac, the read aloud with the Big Mac the read aloud with the visual supports, EET. That was the baby chick one, which had, I think, 42 or 45 slides embedded with videos and use of visual supports, different, different ones, including the core boards. And then the last, uh, the, the last link, which is the core boards demonstrating with the baby chicks also. And just wonderful resource, Julie. We thank you so much for your willingness to share this with special educators, with families, with children, um, especially in a time where we're really looking for virtual instruction, you've managed to, to do an amazing job with this, and which is no surprise. Uh, Julie, thank you on behalf of Caltash and Tash. Thank you all for joining us for this video segment, and I hope that you can take away some, some resources and some new strategies. Last up in this section is Raul Engel. He's going to showcase how he is collaborating with a general education first grade teacher to include his students with significant disabilities into the first grade general education literacy lessons. Uh, he's going to talk about how he embeds some uh, concepts of universal design for learning as well as some really big motivational strategies. <laughs> Hey guys, my name is Raul. I'm a special education teacher over at Irwin Elementary, which is located in Van Nuys, California. So why am I dressed up 
as Mario. Well, let me explain. This is how we've been using the principles of universal design of learning, which is engagement. What we've been doing, what I did today actually, was dress up as Mario because we were learning about the bossy R today. And as you can guess, the bossy R is in the middle of Mario's name. So we had them guess in the beginning of the lesson. They were super excited to see me in the beginning of it. And um, it's what introduced our fun activity for today. Now, I wanted to also share some of um, the things that we did throughout the week uh, to incorporate Bossy R, such as digital flashcards. Okay, so I'm gonna share that with you right now. And here is a digital flashcard of the word bird, which has, as you can see, a Bossy IR word in the middle. As I play them, you can see uh, there's different representations here. We have, uh, we have ASL, which repeats over and over. I recorded audio, as well as the picture representation and the word representation. So then it, it's universal. So those are some of the things that I'm incorporating in my lessons to engage all of our students. On top of that, uh, we did a Mother's Day card. Now, why did we do Mother's Day card? For two reasons. Um, it's going to be Mother's Day on Sunday, on May 10th, but also because Mother has a, as you guessed, a bossy R in the form of ER. So what it looked like was that we made these cards right here. So as you can see, bossy R right here. We did a little drawing first. And then we did a way to um, express what they've learned, had them write down Happy Mother's Day, and we had them share what they thought was, you know, was special about their, their mom, right? So we actually even wrote a letter. Let me show that to you too also. And it looked like this. So it was an opportunity for us to show them the different parts of a letter, which is like the greeting, uh, the body, um, right here, which is the closing, and then also they got the sign in the middle of um, inside their card. So those are some of the things that we've been doing in our, our class. This is a co-teaching class where my, my students are included into a first grade class. And it's been very successful for many reasons, actually. One being that it's easier for us to manage um, our students, easier, either digitally, um, but also allows one teacher to teach, while the other one um, actually manages the classroom or the digital content that we're doing, um, which has been very useful. And it's been great for the general ed teacher to really see the benefits of co-teaching and also incorporating these universal design of learning um, strategies. So I hope you, that you um, enjoyed this little presentation. Some of the ideas that I got were from my professors over at CSUN, but also from my colleagues. So. Um, Thank you for allowing me to share again and um, take care, bye. So for our next section, we have two presenters who will share with us some different strategies for differentiating academic instruction in the distance learning format. So the first is Tori Dario, and she's going to talk about how she embedded some connections between science and literacy in a very practical application of teaching about hand washing. Hi there, my name is Tori Dario and I am the 10th grade education specialist at Wish Academy High School, a fully inclusive high school in Westchester, California. I'm here to talk to you about the How Clean Are Your Hands activity uh, that I put together for some of my students. It was actually inspired by a parent who approached me before we transitioned to virtual learning and asked, what are you doing to keep my, my kids safe at school? And how often is he washing his hands? You know, we work in close proximity with some of our students, especially those with more significant and more complex support needs, you know, providing partial to full physical supports throughout the day to enable these students to access their school environment. So, I thought this would be a great opportunity to teach the importance of hand washing. And, you know, because even though our hands may look clean, we know they're covered in microscopic germs. So 
Wish has also been leading synchronous classes since transitioning to virtual learning, and some of my students have a very difficult time accessing their classrooms on the virtual platform. So I also designed this lesson in a manner which could be done at home um, independently and on the family's own time at a schedule and pace which would suit their needs. Um, I teamed up with uh, another teacher. One of my students has a sibling in the eighth grade. A week before the students were supposed to start uh, the experiment, we let the family know what materials they would need. They're pretty standard materials um, that you can find in just about every kitchen. And uh, then we got to work. We created uh, video models of gathering of materials as well as each step of the experiment. You know, this is designed in a way that the family can do the activity at a time suitable to their needs. And the video models really gave me an opportunity to still teach and to lead my students throughout the experiment, even though I couldn't be physically with them in their home. Uh, also created a materials checklist and a task analysis for each step of the experiment. Uh, these are really great teaching tools and natural cues, right? You've got uh, ingredients lists and directions on different boxes and bags for recipes. You find them in sets of Legos. So this activity is really aimed at also teaching the skill of utilizing a checklist and a task analysis in order to support and foster independence for students and any activity that they may complete later on that will also have a similar checklist or text analysis. Next, a general education teacher, Dione Martinez, will talk about how she embeds the concepts of universal design for learning in a vocabulary lesson that also includes a combination of Spanish and English. Hi, my name is Mrs. Martinez, and I teach at TLC Public Charter in Orange, which is an inclusive school with a high percentage of our students whose first language is Spanish. I am a general education teacher. I teach kindergarten at TLC. In this lesson you're about to see, I use three things to help support not only my English language learners, but also the kids with disabilities, or kids who just need a little bit of extra support. Um, the three things that I do is I use background knowledge first. Um, I read the book Goldilocks and the Three Bears to my students. I read it two or three times and then we watch a little video on them. So I remind them, oh, do you remember the book that we read? We're gonna connect it this way. Another thing I do is I use wait time. Wait time means that I have them, I give them enough time even if it's virtual. I say, okay, think about what you're gonna say where is Goldilocks or where is the porridge? And then they give me that feedback. Oh, I give them enough time to answer at home. And I just wait. Another thing I do is I like using Spanish in my lessons. This is not only beneficial for my English learners, but also for my English only kids. They're learning words like table, mesa, and then they can say it at home as well. I use tarea, homework, so using English and Spanish words doesn't only benefit my EL students, but also my English only students because they are learning some Spanish words and then they can connect that to their learning. So using the word above, okay, and see de la mesa, and then that way my other students could be learning some Spanish words as well. Connecting background knowledge and also giving students wait time, letting them think and process what they're trying to tell me is not only beneficial for my English language learners, but also my kids with disabilities. This video is one of my kids with disabilities favorite video because they love the book Goldilocks and they can connect it and they can process it. And then they're learning something new by doing something fun. Hi, it's Mouth Time Fun Time with Ms. Martinez again. And if you remember in class, we read the book Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Goldilocks y los Tres Osos. So today we're gonna do geometry math location with our book that we've already read, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So we have our table, which I'm gonna put in the middle of the room. 
We have Goldilocks right here, and we have the baby porridge right here. So I'm going to put, let's see, I'm going to start with Goldilocks here and the baby porridge right there. So let's think about it. Let's talk about Goldilocks first. Think about where Goldilocks is. Where is Goldilocks? Okay, so think about it. Go ahead and then go ahead and tell me. Good. Goldilocks can be beside the table. Al lado de la mesa. Beside the table. Al lado de la mesa. What's another way we can say it? Yep, she can be next to the table. Está al lado de la mesa. Está junto de la mesa. And another way. Go ahead and tell me. And yeah, she can be on the right side of the table. A la derecha de la mesa. Right side of the table. A la derecha de la mesa. Now think about the baby porridge. Go ahead and think about it. And tell me, where do you think the baby porridge is? Where is the baby porridge? Yep, the baby porridge can be above the table. Encima de la mesa, above the table. What else? On top of the table, it can be on top of the table. Está en la mesa, arriba, en la mesa, encima de la mesa. Good job. So that's where the baby porridge is and that's where Goldilocks. Let's try another one. This is one of your favorites. You guys love doing this one in class. So let's look at that one. Think about Goldilocks first. Where is Goldilocks? Go ahead and tell me. Yep, Goldilocks is above the table. Goldilocks está encima de la mesa. Goldilocks is on top of the table. What else? Good. She is above the table. She's on top and above the table. Está encima de la mesa. Está sobre la mesa. Okay? Arriba. Okay? Now look at the baby porridge. Where is the baby porridge? Go ahead and tell me. ¿Dónde está? ¿Dónde está? Yep. It is above Goldilocks. The baby porridge is above Goldilocks. Está, está encima the Goldilocks. What else can you tell me about the baby porridge? Yep, the baby porridge is upside down. It is upside down Goldilocks. That's a good one too. Good job. So remember, this is Goldilocks and the three bears positioning. Okay, location. Goldilocks y los tres osos. You guys love this story. Make sure you watch this video and practice. Good job and have a great rest of your day. For this next section, we'll focus on the important role that educators play in helping students to maintain their social connections with peers from school. So here we'll have Megan Gross, an educator on special assignment, who will introduce us to several other educators who have been doing great work in helping students to maintain connections with one another. Hi, my name is Megan Gross. I'm a special education teacher on special assignment in the Poway Unified School District, the 2017 California Teacher of the Year, and so lucky to be a colleague of my dear friend Michelle Brown. And her students at Design 39 campus are going to talk to us about what does it mean to be included um, and to have friends in the middle of a pandemic. So, uh, Michelle, could I have you introduce yourself um, and your students? Hi, my name is Michelle Brown, and I am the, um, I teach sixth through eighth grade students um, that are in a self-learning for autism. And we do a lot of uh, inclusion activities. Uh, when we were on campus, we were doing a lot of inclusion activities. And so we've had to kind of think outside the box quite a bit to figure out how we can do that during this pandemic. So um, right off the bat, what we did was we uh, we started Zoom meetings every day of the week. Um, those days we include our peer friends. Um, we were having a lunch um, every Wednesday. Um, 
So we would invite all any kids on campus to come down and join us for lunch. So what we did was we just continued that into the pandemic um, via Zoom. So on, on Wednesdays, it's the exact same time, we still have lunch bunch with our buddies. And everybody comes and what we do is we talk as, talk as a full group and then we break up into, we go into breakout room and then I give everybody a question to kind of, you know, conversation. And then we come back into a full group and then we go out into another breakout room. So we just keep recreating different breakout rooms so that everybody gets a chance to see um, all kinds of, you know, everybody, all kinds of students and get it um, um, and use their voice. So um, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So we've got, today we have Ellie with us. Ellie is our best buddies president and Shelly, Ellie is our leader. So um, I'm, I'm super grateful for Ellie. Ellie, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you've been keeping in touch with your buddy during this pandemic? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Ellie Dorfman and I'm in eighth grade at Design 39. Um, I've been in the club since they joined last year, in the beginning of last year. Um, during this pandemic, it was um, hard to start off with, with um, different, like not the normal schedule we usually have. Um, so I, we've, my best buddy and I have been trying to have a regular schedule like we did on campus. So every week, usually on Tuesdays, um, we like to go on Zoom and connect. And then I've been joining all the class Zooms and sharing it so as many peers can stay connected with our kids. So we have an Instagram site that um, that, hel that Ellie helps to administer. And, um, and so she's been doing a great job getting the word out to friends to remind them that, you know, hey, lunch bunch is coming up and Fabulous Friday is coming up and here's the theme and here's the password. And so... Um, our Instagram page has been really helpful to keep everybody connected and keep the communication going. And then you've also created, and I'm going to pull it up here on the share screen. Um, so while I'm pulling up the share screen, maybe you can talk about what it is you've created. Well, um, I created a Padlet because I wanted, I wanted to be a central place for our students to be able to be um, our Zoom meetings with peers because because a lot of times well either either our students maybe they miss the meeting and so this is an opportunity for them to at least be able to stay connected if they missed it or we have students that want to just keep you know they like to get online and they like to just keep you know watching things over and over and for and for them to be able to keep seeing the communication that's taking place that conversation um, it's just it's just a great model for them um, and also just a, a great place for them to be able to to look at their peers and say oh that's so and so or that's so and so and just to kind of refresh their memory on on who's who and and talk about the different peers and be able to talk about that with you know with their family members share it with their family and then be able to comment um, on the padlet underneath you can you can um, add comments and so it's also a place where they can communicate with each other like oh you know I really like the the hearts you put on the window and then you know the student that whose picture that is can write back and say oh thank you you know so it's it's creating that conversation um, among our students among our peers and then our instructional assistants have also been fabulous um, creating virtual field trips and um, different kinds of videos where they're sharing things that they've cooked or um, different things that they've seen outside or uh, just saying hello. So those are all um, opportunities for students to be, to just stay connected with everybody and just kind of keep that consistency and that, um, that familiarity, so. Well, I love that. I think what you and Ellie are creating at Design 39 Campus is just am amazing and incredible. Um, and it's been so fun following your Instagram page, Ellie, um, and seeing what you've all been up to. So thank you so much for sharing this idea. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. 
I'm so excited today to get to spotlight my friend and colleague, Jennifer Conlin, and the incredible work she is doing with Best Buddies at Del Norte High School. Jen, would you mind sharing with everybody how you're keeping kids connected during distance learning in the middle of a pandemic? I'd love to. Um, I am lucky enough to say this is my 25th year of uh, being a special educator, my 15th year of leading a Best Buddies chapter, and it is one like no other. And luckily, we had a lot of systems in place um, that the students were really used to and that we're falling back on to keep in touch and keep um, the commitment of friendship and inclusion real even during this time of distance learning. So one thing that we've always done is made things as visual as possible and as routine as possible for parents, students, and um, faculty and staff of the high school. We're blessed Del Norte Best Buddies is the largest club on campus with at times almost 200 members of our 2400 member campus. I'll show you a few ways that we're um, keeping um, connected and what we're doing to still have fun even though we're socially distant. The first thing we've been doing is continuing to push out weekly emails um, that share what's going on. So just this last week, um, we announced our new Best Buddies president. And because so many of our students are visual in nature, we always include many photos. So this is our new president, Abby, and our outgoing presidents, Toby and Bella. Um, Lastly, we have uh, moved our Monday um, lunchtime chapter meeting into a Monday Zoom. Um, our school has a pretty regimented schedule and uh, every day between 12 and 1 is lunch. So we're um, putting our Best Buddies chapter meeting right in there. And I've been so encouraged most Mondays we have upwards to 45 kids logging on and joining us. So this last week, in addition to announcing our president, um, we um, hosted a virtual talent show. So each kid's got up to 90 seconds to um, share their talent. And they, um, they're they great with technology. They signed up using the Google Doc. They all log into the Zoom. We've also been hosting weekly um, Netflix watch parties. Um, and there's ones through California Best Buddies and then our own. When we host our own um, watch parties, we send out a poll and let the kids choose what um, movie they might like to watch. So it ended up that the kids wanted to watch The Incredibles, um, this most recent um, Zoom watch party. So before we, they can actually log in and watch the party, um, watch the movie, they need to um, take a few steps to add the, um, the extension to their uh, computer. And so we've made um, a nice PowerPoint that explains how to do this. Um, and it's pretty easy for the kids and their parents to follow. So um, make sure they're using Chrome. Um, and you um, search for Net Netflix Party Chrome extension and you add this extension. And then um, there's a video that just shows all the steps that we made for the kids to watch. And we really have had no problems with most of the kids, um, everyone being able to do this. And then once they start the party, um, um, the kids can make comments and say hi to their friends and discuss the movie while they're watching. And the moderator can also stop um, the movie to get feedback and you know, kind of touch base with the group. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, and you guys should try it with your group. Take it away. Hi, I'd like to introduce um, one of our amazing Best Buddies trios. Um, Anish has two peer buddies, both Mason and Akela. And um, before school became at home and distant, um, they were um, anything but. Um, they are a stellar threesome who can't, um, way to spend time together but now we've had to find new and creative ways to spend some time together and keep the connection and they're going to share with us what that's looked like lately who would like to start off i can start off if you want me to no uh, i've raised my hand first <laughs> oh, okay, okay Anish. uh what do i say what have you been doing so that you keep in touch with akela and mason I uh, I was doing Best Buddies. And now that we're at home, what have you been doing? Um, uh, I, I've been doing my homework. 
Mm-hmm. What did we do last Friday, Anish? Uh, last Friday we did biking. Yeah. How'd that come to be, Mason? Uh, so Anish and I were kind of bored, and we didn't really want to um, watch Disney Plus because we had just finished watching Aladdin. So I just randomly yeah. texted him, and we went on a social distance bike ride with bandanas and helmets. It's pretty hey, fun. Mason. Mason. Yeah. I know math. You can't change math, Anish. <laughs> <laughs> They're both, uh, yeah, quote unquote math nerds, the two of them. Yeah, that was incredible, too. And yeah. Mason, Michaela, what about you? Um, like activities that we've been doing? Yeah. Too. Yeah, so sometimes we always try to get on Zoom meetings and watch movies together. And I try to text Anish as much as I can. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we are in this together. We are in this together. We are. Yeah. And in our final section, we recognize the need that some families have for direct support. So first we'll have Jody Agnew Navarro, who will tell us more about the ways that she is supporting families in her infant toddler early education program. My name is Jody Agnew Navarro. I work for the Chime Institute's early education programs. I'm an early childhood special education teacher. I support children from birth to three years old and their families in home and also in a classroom caregiver and me setting. And I also support preschool age children in a fully inclusive preschool program. Just as you individualize supports for the children you serve, you need to individualize support for the parents as well. Uh, When preparing for this talk, I saw something that really resonated with me. It said, we are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. I think as you support families, you should keep this statement in mind. There are a lot of things to consider when working with families. You need to understand their culture, their resources, their parenting style, and their priorities. Let the parents choose if, when, and how they communicate with you and focus on developing relationships with each family. Keep the lines of communication open. Ask open-ended questions to start and extend conversation and listen. Listen to understand and connect not to solve all their problems. Follow up with helpful information and remember to validate their feelings and provide positive feedback. When we started our program, we started with a parent survey. We asked how we can support um, the families, what were their needs, concerns, and priorities, what were their preferences for communication and activities, Did they want to connect by phone, email, text, video conferencing, and what was their access to technology? When we started our distance learning program, we thought it was going to be for a short time period. And now that we're seeing it's going to be a long time period, we have um, been reevaluating, making changes to our program, and we have sent out a new survey to the parents asking for specific feedback about um, our distance learning program. And we included some mental health kind of check-in questions for the families as well to see how we can better support them. One of the first things I did when we started our distance learning program was to start a website. Um, It's a blog style website. I wanted all of our activities and interventions in one place. I wanted them to be easily accessible to the families and I wanted them to be able to access them at times that were convenient to them. I wanted to reduce all of the emails that the parents were getting from um, the different therapists and teachers. And I wanted the parents to be able to choose the activities based on their child's developmental needs and interest. And um, we also added a um, parent resource section to our blog so that um, we have a lot of ideas and um, suggestions for parents as well. So it's not just focused on the children. Based on our family's concerns, priorities, and feedback from our survey, we started weekly parent groups. 
Um, those have been very successful. Um, and um, the parents' primary concerns that they identified were that their children were off schedule, having sleep difficulties, and increasing um, negative behaviors. So um, one of our most successful groups was one that we did on developing routines. So um, we created um, this daily schedule with a, um, a lot of pictures for each family to be able to individualize to meet the needs of their family and child. And um, the parents have reported um, that this schedule has been very helpful for helping them to organize themselves and most importantly, in assisting their children to um, grow, develop, and meet their goals. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much. Goodbye. And finally, we'll interview a teacher, Lorena Rodriguez, about her experiences both as a parent and as a transition teacher collaborating with the parents of her students. Hi there, my name is Lorena Rodriguez. I am a teacher for adult transition special education. Um, I'm also a parent of two children. I have a middle schooler and I also have a third grader in elementary school um, who's uh, diagnosed with a learning disability. So in terms of my students, um, one of the ways that I've really tried to balance their social emotional needs, um, you know, during the start of the COVID closures, I really took the time to counsel and meet with um, not only my students, but their their parent as well to determine what their needs were. Um, first and foremost, any health needs that they needed in the home and made sure we addressed those. And then we discussed what sort of um, schedule is going to work best for them. Um, we spent probably the first two weeks sorting those issues out and making sure that everyone felt supported within the home and that the learning opportunities that we were able to offer were going to uh, work for their student. Um, in terms of at home, I did similar uh, with my children, particularly my third grader who uh, requires a pretty um, strict schedule. Um, we worked alongside with her teacher to determine which, which subjects and which times were going to be the most valuable for her to access at this time. So then we created schedules for her. Um, you know, and I just basically made sure that I checked in with her daily. Um, she started a reading journal to document any emotions she was feeling. Um, Funny thing, though, that she basically documented all of the eating opportunities that she was having at home. So, you know, as we went through this experience, her journaling has has been a little bit more in depth because, um, you know, like all of us, change is difficult. And particularly for her, she was missing friends and social opportunities. Um, so we've just tried to also incorporate that as much as we can through through the tech technology that, that we have. You know, we really did have to take into consideration um, access to technology. Um, some of my young adults um, either did not have the access to the equipment that they needed, um, so we had to make sure that that was then provided. Um, and then also teaching parents um, how to utilize the technology, so that was something that we needed to keep in mind. Um, the, my my adult students are older. Um, they also have family members who are older, and there's not necessarily the generation isn't as um, knowledgeable with Zoom or those other platforms. So there was a lot of training that needed to go into that behind the scenes and and looking at what we could use to start with, and then where we could build from that. The only additional piece I would I would. Um, also consider was the linguistic background of um, the young adults. Um, working with the population that I do, sometimes language um, on a daily basis in the way that we communicate in terms of body language and uh, spoken language is done through different modes of communication. So we did have to brainstorm and work with the families how we were going to best address um, communicating. So there are some families um, where I will do communication through phone or video call, but I also will support that then with uh, written instructions via email to, to allow, um, you know, better time to process or have access to that language. I think that the 
the hardest part of going through this experience is making sure that we have maintained social connection um, with one another. So within my program, um, my students, the staff, and myself, we meet daily, um, even if it's just a quick check-in, 10, 30 minutes, um, to check in with each other, to listen to music, to remember why um, we consider ourselves a community. Um, and then, you know, the same thing with my daughter as well. She's a social butterfly and um, has been around peers her entire life. And to suddenly take that away, it's very hard for an eight-year-old mind to process. Um, you know, there, there was an opportunity where a friend drove by on her bike and she got really upset and she said, I don't understand why I can't hug my friend. Mom, this just isn't fair. And it's not. <laughs> kind of, um, we want to keep everybody safe. And so I think being very honest with my young adults, also with my daughter, um, age appropriate, but also really honest with her so she understands why this is happening, um, has helped her process a little bit better and understand that what she's doing is not a punishment. You know, what she's doing is she's helping to protect um, her community and her friends and her loved ones. So I want to thank you for joining us for this webinar on behalf of TASH and CALTASH. If you would like to learn more about the things that TASH and CALTASH are doing, please visit our websites. The TASH website is TASH.org and for CALTASH, which is a state chapter of TASH, it's CALTASH.org. Thank you so much and we hope we see you again soon.